Good morning. My name is Taro Kekkonen. I come from Finland, from Ottawa Folk High School. And it's really a pleasure to be with you today. So I have to thank Egle, whom I can't see right now at the moment, <laughs> but for the invitation right. to... So, so it's all thanks to her that we are here today. This is my colleague. Good morning. My name is Aki Luostarinen, and I'm from Otama Folk High School as well. I'm a psychology teacher, and then I uh, teach in phenomenon-based learning as well. So, our topic today is phenomenon-based learning. I don't know how familiar that uh, term is to you, but I hope that in within two hours it's a bit, at least a bit more familiar. You will find our presentation on this uh, uh, website also later on, and probably it will be on the conference sites as well. Our two hours look something like this today. So first there's a bit of orientation and a bit of discussion. So we won't be talking all the time. You, you'll have to do part of the talking as well. And uh, then we'll uh, discuss a bit uh, about the elements of phenomenon-based learning, what, what uh, belongs to that. Then there's also speed dating. You'll have a date, a speed date today. And then we will tell a bit of our own experience, what we've been doing uh, in this context with our students. And then there's also a short closing reflection. But first, I would like you to think a bit, stop to think, when was it last time you stopped to wonder about something? And what was it about? If you'd please, you could choose two or three people close to you and have a short uh, discussion and think about when was it last time when you really stopped to wonder about something? And what was it about? Please. This was just a small morning exercise to wake you up. But it was, I think, also quite important because at least we think that wondering has a lot to do with learning. But we will come later to this topic, later today. We will come back to that. But then about phenomenon-based learning. When you hear these three words, whatever it is in, in Estonian, what is it in Estonian? Phenomenal. <laughs> I wasn't able to <laughs> say that, sorry. <laughs> but phenomenon based learning, some of you have heard that, some of you maybe not, or at least you have seen it written on the, on the conference program. But when you hear these words, uh, what do they bring you to your mind? What comes to your mind? Just association. You don't, I, I'm not asking for any definition, but just what comes to your mind when you hear these words? Just say aloud. Could you, Aki, maybe take this? Just say aloud. Yeah? Phenomenon is something unexpected. Phenomenon is something unexpected, surprising. Okay. Like wow. Like wow, <laughs> yes. What else? Okay. About the learning, okay? Maybe it's really the sensibility, uh, like digital, but you call it a writing or a like picture. And phenomenon based is a like picture, but you are studying uh, through the kind of picture. Okay, did you hear that? That phenomenon-based learning is not, about only, not only about texts and writing, but also about pictures and images. Pictures and happenings. Pictures and happenings, okay. Pictures and actions. Mm -hmm. 
not only writing and reading and text. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Something special. Mm -hmm. Systematic studies and in integrating the subjects. Mm -hmm. Integrating an approach to learning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Enthusiast. Mm -hmm. Okay. To be enthusiastic about something. See võiks olla ka üksteist arvestav õppe. No. Cooperation. Okay. Very good. Problem solving. Mm -hmm. They're all correct answers. <laughs> You're doing very good this morning. <laughs> Discovering, mm -hmm. yes, correct answer again. <laughs> this was a bit of a phenomenon for me to listen Estonian and write in English at the same time. <laughs> yes. Okay. We actually agree on everything that you said and is, is written here. We also think that phenomenon-based learning is, is about uh, cooperation, solving problems together, uh, discovering things. Very often there are uh, surprises included and it's an approach to learning, as somebody said. And it's also, in our opinion, it's also in integrating and also integrating school subjects. So it's uh, interdisciplinary work. I don't know if you have followed the, the news, but there was big headlines uh, in newspapers globally about uh, renewing the Finnish school system. And this is about these headlines are about uh, what we call uh, uh, phenomenon-based learning. Uh, we will soon get, next year, we will get a new national curriculum and phenomenon-based learning is included in the, in the uh, national curriculum. And then the, the international press found that out and interviewed somebody and then they made these headlines which say that Finland wants to abandon teaching subjects at school and there will be no more physics and maths and Finland is to stop teaching individual subjects. That's not true. It's largely, totally exaggerated. It is not true. We will, we will uh, teach and learn more by topic and not only by uh, uh, subject, but we won't abandon the subjects, but we will have more of integrating the subjects. But that's, that was quite interesting to, to, to read these news, which were not true. So we think that uh, phenomenon-based learning is more like, an, like you said, an approach to, to learning and and studying rather than a method or pedagogy, but an approach that can be carried out by, for example, uh, inquiry-based learning or problem-based learning, like you, you mentioned here, the problem solving. So the idea is to teach and learn broader concepts 
rather than ask the students to, to memorize facts or formula. And in, in phenomenon-based learning, so the phenomenon refers to a bigger entity that we study together with the students or pupils. And uh, the students have a, quite an active role in phenomenon-based learning. So it's not so that the teacher is teaching and pouring all the information into the heads of the, the students and pupils, but the students take uh, an active role and a lot of responsibility also is given to the students in this kind of, of learning. We've been doing this systematically in our school since uh, 2007. Every year since then we have had approximately five uh, phenomena or five topics, you could also call them topics uh, or themes that we've been studying together with our students. And uh, when I asked our students and our teachers <coughs> what is essential in their opinion when we talk about phenomenon-based learning, and this is on the basis of their own personal experience. A lot of people, both the students and the teachers, they mentioned borders. So uh, phenomenon-based learning includes various kinds of crossing various borders. It's not only uh, in their opinion and in their experience, uh, crossing the borders of school subjects, but also crossing the borders of roles, for example, because it could be that the student becomes or already is an expert in the field. He or she might know more about the topic than the, the teacher, for example. And it's also in, in our teachers and students' experience, crossing the borders of organizations and schools, because we've been doing this together with other schools. Then our students and teachers, especially the, the students mentioned freedom. They think about freedom in this context, because how we have carried out phenomenon-based learning is that we have given our students a lot of freedom. They, we choose the topic together, Let's say that the, the phenomenon could be welfare state, or it could be happiness, or it could be power. Let's say that we study, start this uh, academic year studying happiness together, for example. In this case, we would give the students the right and the freedom to choose their perspective and their angle and their approach to happiness just as they wish to. So they can understand the concept of happiness like they wish, and uh, then they start uh, studying this big entity from their own interest and from their own angle. Which means that the te we teachers, we don't really know what will come out. That's the, the other side of the... the coin, or however they say in English. Then it's a lot about teamwork as well. Because let's say that happiness is here. One student is studying it from this angle, another from this, one from here, one from here. And they're all doing their individual study works, or then working in pairs or in groups, but not really together. But at the end of each... Uh, phenomenon-based learning project, we collect all the outcomes and the results together. And there, when, when all of these students tell what they've been doing and discovering and finding out, we will get the big picture of, of this one entity. So it's a lot about teamwork as well. And also, when talking about the teachers, it has to be teamwork. It's very, very challenging, I would say impossible, to integrate subjects if the subject teachers don't cooperate. And then it's a lot about communication. But it's also hard work, because in this way of studying where the students get an active role, they are not given anything. They have to do 
most of the work themselves, because the teachers are not really teaching. I, I would say that we'll stop teaching, actually. We shouldn't tell our bosses, <laughs> but that's what we've been doing. So the, the, the students, they are choosing their approach themselves, and they are deciding exactly what they want to study, but they get a lot of guidance. We don't call it uh, teaching, but they get a lot of guidance, so we have to put resources on, on that. But it's hard work, because you have to find out yourself, you have to choose your learning material yourself, you have to produce a lot yourself. So the students, they can't be consumers, they have to, to become uh, uh, producers of, of content and information. But our students tell, give always this feedback that it's really, really rewarding, this way of studying, because they feel that they, what they learn, they learn somehow deeper. It's not just memorizing the, the facts, but there's a lot of feeling also involved and a lot of, of individual experience. But then, then it's also about leaving the comfort zone. So you have to take a sort of a risks as well. I hope he didn't take any risk. I hope he has a working <laughs> parachute, but, but maybe this picture is to tell something about leaving the, the comfort zone. And for the students, it means that you have, you have to let go of the control. At least in Finland, teachers are used to controlling the, the, the situation, but if you give the students as much freedom as we've been doing, then it's impossible to have the total control. So it means that you have to trust your students as well. And in our experience, they've really been worth the trust. So they have taken the, the responsibility. I could tell you shortly also about our school so that you know the, the, the context where we were working. We are a folk high school, like I mentioned, but within the folk high school, we also have an uh, upper secondary school for adults. Thais Kasvanute Gymnasium? Yes. <laughs> that is totally online, a web-based upper secondary school for adults. We, at the moment, we have there 670 students, approximately, who are uh, living around Finland, scattered around the country and actually around the world, and studying online. And it is mainly with these students that uh, we are doing this phenomenon based studying, also with some other programs and other students, but mainly with these online upper secondary school adults. And when we established this school online back in 1997, which is a long period of time in the, in the history of the Internet, uh, we decided that we won't establish a traditional school online. So we thought that we have to think it somehow differently. There's no sense to, to transfer the traditional classroom teaching to the web. So we wanted to think it a bit differently, and we didn't start building the, the school on the idea of control with all these tests and having the control over the, the students who are, but we wanted to have a school that is open and where we trust our students. So, for example, our school, it's always open. You can start, you can register, and, and or enroll and start studying any time of the year. We have no periods or semesters. And, uh, and also, all our study materials, they have been open for, for anybody since 1997. Nowadays, they are, they are all produced. The, the study material that we uh, produce, they are uh, produced under Creative Commons uh, license, but we have this principle of openness and then of trust. And with this trust, we mean that we don't want to control the students, but instead we want to trust them. 
for example, we don't have any exams on our upper secondary school, there will be the, the national exam, what we call the matriculation examination. And that will be the same test nationally for everybody, but it's at the end of the, the studies, which usually take three years. But within our school, we have no, no tests or no exams. I could continue for hours on this topic, but I think we need to, to get a bit further on to, to phenomenon-based learning. Our students, like I said, they are all adults. There are some exceptions, some minors, but, but adults living everywhere in Finland, and the age scale is, in practice, it's from 16 to, I don't know how old our oldest student is at the moment, maybe 75 or something at this moment. And they, they are, they all, uh, all of our students, they have a reason why they have chosen our school. And mostly it has to do, we ask all of them when they come in, why they have chosen us. And, and mostly it is, it has something to do with this flexible way of arranging the studies. They are, they could be people working in three shifts, so it would be impossible for them to, to uh, attend the, the classes, even if they were in the evening, or there are professional athletes, or there are people with health problems or social problems. There are people living abroad, parents of small children, all, all kinds of reasons why our students find our way of arranging studying more flexible and also possible for them. We, like I said, when, when I showed you the headlines from the international press, uh, phenomenon-based learning is not the only way of arranging studying in, in Finland. We, in our school, have three ways to, to offer our courses. And I'm using here the, the food metaphor. So first of all, we have their, what we call the buffet uh, table. We call them non-stop courses, which means that all our upper secondary school courses, they are available online anytime. So according to this metaphor, our students can, can go to the buffet and pick any meal that they want to on their tray at any time. This means individual studies, because everybody is having his or her own face on the, on the studies. So studying together is not really possible in this buffet. But when we, then we have the a la carte restaurant as well, according to this uh, metaphor. We call them collaborative courses, which means that we offer this year maybe 60 courses this way, and, and we give the schedule to the students previous spring, and then in the autumn they can choose, for example, if they want to study mathematics together in a group, then they choose one of the uh, collaborative courses in mathematics. And then it means that it starts on a certain date and ends on a certain day, date. It can be like six or seven weeks long, the period. And, uh, and then the students, they know that there will be other students studying at the same time. And that enables then group work and teamwork and cooperation more. And then they can use the group and others, their peers as resources as well. And of course, then the, st uh, then the teacher is able to, to teach a group, not only individuals. So that's the second setting. And then there's the phenomenon-based learning, which we could um, call the kitchen. And in the kitchen, there are no ready meals that we would serve the, the students, but we take the, the students to the kitchen and then we collect the ingredients together with them and start preparing the meals together. I'm not sure if you follow the metaphor, but I, I hope. So three ways of, of accomplishing uh, upper secondary school uh, courses in, in our school. The individual work 
or non-stop courses, then the collaborative courses, and then phenomenon-based learning. And the students can freely choose between these, and they combine these. They can be on studying, for example, mathematics on a collaborative course, and they might be uh, taking uh, English at the same time from the buffet table, studying that individually, and then they might join uh, phenomenon-based learning entity studying, for example, this happiness. And while studying happiness, they might accomplish courses in psychology, for example, or mathematics, statistics, or, or, or civics, for example. Depends on what their approach and their angle to this uh, topic is. Are we ready go to go for a date? Yeah. Do you have any oh, questions oh, yeah, any at questions the moment? I always have this problem when, Comments or when I open my mouth and I'm not <laughs> able to <laughs> shut it anymore. Yeah. Any comments or questions at this point? Okay, so we, then we'll go on a date. <laughs> yeah. Will you explain that? Uh, are you familiar with the concept of speed dating? Have you seen it on television or somewhere? The idea is that you get to know many people, very fast-paced dating, so it's two or three minutes. You talk to someone and then you hear the bell and you go to someone else. So without that, now you get to get up and walk around the space a little bit and choose someone you don't know that well at the moment and go to someone you think, okay, I want to talk to that one and tell them who I am and what do I think about phenomenon-based learning. You can use these questions that we've uh, written down or you can talk in general about teaching and about problem-based learning and phenomenon-based learning and things like this. But we will uh, give you a sound when you need to change your partner and then you can walk around freely in this space but always choose some new people you don't know when we give you the um, changing sound. I think we'll just say it because the sound is so loud <laughs> on the microphone. Have you understood? So okay. now you can get up and find Choose someone you date. don't know. Yeah. How did you uh, how did you like it? Did you talk about phenomenon based learning or in general about stuff? Okay, good. It's not uh, it's life. You talk about other things as well. So do our students when they are in phenomenon based learning. We started with the question: What have you wondered? What have you stopped to wonder? lately and to think about and I think this picture is good uh, in a way that our children naturally they are curious they wonder about things they uh, they question they ask silly questions and when we grow up we usually somehow lose the ability to see and feel and touch and smell and be curious and ask about the world around us we get busy and, and so on and so on. And our idea with our students is somehow get back to the curiosity of a childhood. And that's why we've given so much freedom to our students. When they hear a phenomenon like happiness, they can interpret it as they want. What is happen happiness for me? Do I have problems with the concept of happiness or is everything okay and how do I want to uh, explore and study, study the concept and what do I want to learn about it? And be open, we as a stu uh, teachers and then our students, to be open about the world and what's around us and inside our heads as well. Uh, as Taru, Taru said earlier, we've done uh, phenomenon-based projects from 2007, and we've had many 
many phenomena to uh, phenomena to uh, explore, and how we choose them. One uh, interesting thing that we came up to was this UBC Museum in Bremen, Germany, and they have these uh, seven global trends that they've uh, uh, choose to their uh, ex ex exhibition, yeah. <laughs> and all of these seven, uh, all these seven themes or uh, phenomena are something that are at the same time global and personal for everyone who lives on this planet. Uh, climate change, communication, sex and gender, time, human rights, migration, and global economy. Yeah, seven. <laughs> I had to count. Uh, and we went to Germany with our students. We had uh, approximately five students. We had a, a fund, funds, money to go there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we took our students and went to Germany to see the exhibition and to go through what, to, what could we uh, learn from these uh, seven phenomena and could we do it as well in our school to study and explore them there. So we've, um, we've um, explored these with our students, but they are not the only ones. Then we, of course, uh, check the calendar we find out if there's current events, globally or nationally, that we could explore. And one was, for example, uh, the presidential elections in the United States. And we have this uh, phenomenon called the greatest of the world in the world. And you can uh, interpret it as, as a fact, so to speak, or ironically, how do you want to uh, interpret it? Is it but it was, uh, we uh, found out about the uh, parties in the United States and the uh, candidates and how are the politics in the United States, what's the uh, role of the president and so on and so on with our students. Then, for example, in, uh, when we had uh, finished parliamentary elections, not this year, but the last time, uh, we had the phenomenon called the power, which could be interpreted as a political power but some students, for example, uh, started to think about uh, power between uh, personal relationships or inside a family, and so on. The Finnish word for power cannot be interpreted as an electrical power, so it's a bit different than the English word. It's, it's always a political or personal power, so to speak. Uh, then the Olympics, we've had two phenomena, Sitius, Altius, Fortius. We did it a uh, few years back, and then we had On Top of the World, which could also be interpreted as uh, on top of the sports world, or cultural world, or personal world. I could add to this, when we had this uh, phenomenon called On Top of the World, at the same time, there was another school in Finland who has uh, expatriate children studying all around mm -hmm. uh, the world. But the, the school is based in Finland and the kids, they are Finns and uh, studying in Finnish language. And they were uh, studying the same topic, but they just called it climbing the Himalayas or something like that. Yeah. You, Oh, Mount Everest, yes. Johanne mm. here is actually working for that school, so he knows better. But it was very nice that we, they were uh, studying the same topic with their small kids mm. and we with our uh, adult students. Yeah. So that's one example of the cooperation that we are doing with other organizations, mm. crossing the borders of, of organizations, as I mm. said earlier. Yeah, these are just a uh, yeah, few examples, but um, Tarun talks about how we give the freedom to the students. They can choose whatever they want, but of course we have to do some planning in, in advance. We can't just 
choose a name, um, a title for a phenomenon, and then just say, okay, do what you want, and we just sit back and watch like this. No. Uh, we have usually uh, from three or two to five teachers that do teamwork, and they go through the um, phenomenon and start to think what could be the uh, aspects or point of views that the students might find out when they come to the phenomenon. And what are the, uh, for example, uh, what comes from uh, our subjects, from our curricula, these kind of things. We go them through in advance and we think about could we use um, outside professionals or do we have our the knowing in our own school, the, for example, for virtual realities. Can we do it ourselves or should we ask someone from outside our school to give a lecture or do some kind of um, smaller project inside the phenomenon-based project with our students? And this is one example. We have this uh, phenomenon called dimensions or realities. It was a bit difficult to translate to English. Uh, and you could, we always somehow try to visualize for our students what it might be, what you could study when you come to the phenomenon. And we, here we had six, six points of views. It could be a reality of a fictional, uh, it could be fictional worlds and realities. It could be physics or, me, is it metaphysics? Metaphysics, yeah, in English. <laughs> and then it can be, um, something to do with social uh, reality uh, from the future, one branch in our tree. Uh, it can be a dimensional reality of uh, our, inside our own mind, where you can study, for example, psychology or re religion or philosophy. And then it can be a virtual and virtual realities and game, um, game univer universes, game dimensions. And this is, uh, the visualization is for those students who don't know what to do when they come to the phenomenon. There are students who, when they see the name, they are, okay, I will study this. I'll start with these uh, points of views. But then there are students that are like, I have no idea what to do. I, I, I'm, I just want to do a phenomenon-based learning, but I don't know how to approach the subject or the theme. So it helps those students as well. Then Daro talked about happiness. Earlier, we have this, uh, these baths, baths uh, labyrinth. You could choose your own ways to, to the center where you find the happiness at the end, hopefully. Uh, you could interpret it as uh, personal happiness on a personal level, on a welfare state level, or society's level, or in general, like philosophy uh, from the point of philosophy, what is happiness? How do you define happiness as a concept and good life? These kind of uh, point of views. And our phenomenon-based projects usually uh, lasts about six to eight weeks. And many times we follow kind of the steps of a problem-based learning. Not, not exactly, but uh, um, a bit sovelletto, um, muneldo, adjust to our needs. We usually start with brainstorming. We gather together on online um, online conference program, and we start to find out what are all the possible point of views, in addition to those that we have thought in advance. Uh, what could we do? What kind of cooperations could we do outside our schools? Uh, could, could our students do something with their families, perhaps, with their children? Or could they combine their work with their uh, other uh, hobbies or their uh, professional uh, careers? Many of our students work at the same time while they study, study at our school. So that's the start when we get many ideas, and most of them perhaps are never went through with our students. 
Some of them are uh, forgotten after the brainstorming, and then we find those good ones to keep up and to explore, explore uh, more deeply. And the exploring and working is the main part of our projects. It's approximately four weeks. And it's even though every student might uh, choose their own point of views, we use um, a website, a forum, which is open to everyone so that they can share their processes from the beginning till the end. They will start with, okay, I'm going to, I, I have this point of view, and then I'm going to do this, and maybe I'll, I'll uh, use these and these materials, and I'll do a PowerPoint, I'll do a presentation, or I'll do a video, and so on and so on. They kind of um, gives a diary online about their own project. And then they can help each other. They can go through others' uh, learning diaries, and they, they can find out, that, okay, this one, my uh, peer has a problem, I have a solution, I might be able to help, or I know who could help, who of the teachers could help. And this is what um, kind of uh, helps us and our guidance. There's a lot of guidance in phenomenon-based learning because the students have to do so much themselves. But we don't have to do all as, as teachers. It doesn't have to be always us who helps and finds the solutions. The students can help each other, and that's usually uh, the best way to solve problems when they think about it uh, together online and on our conference meetings. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, quite phenomenal <laughs> how yeah. our students uh, help and support each other mm. in, in this phenomenon-based learning. I think they do that even more than in, in traditional classroom. Because yeah. our students, they are all online. They never meet each other. They never meet us. But they communicate a lot online. And maybe it is because we have given them the, the freedom and mm. they have been, or they've learned to take the responsibility not only of their own learning but somehow of, of their peer learners as well. Mm. So it works fantastically, mm. uh, even better than we <coughs> expected. Yeah, and especially when it comes to, for example, technical uh, problems, we cannot know everything. We cannot know every mobile app or uh, um, online uh, website and so I lose applications and these. So they, when, they, when some, of, some of them knows them, they can help to solve the problems what they have when it comes to that. We don't have to know everything as a teacher. But it's, it's as you said, it needs, you need to go away from your comfort zone. As a teachers, we usually like to keep the control and we have this culture that the teacher has to know everything. If a student asks, you always need to know the answer. But of course, we are not living in a world that we are not dictionaries or we are not uh, um, encyclopedias. <laughs> yeah. So we can also learn from our students. That's that's really rewarding. And then for the last week, we gather together to share our outcomes. And they are in many forms and many colors, as those <laughs> pencils maybe <laughs> represent on the presentation. And many, many shapes as well. Did you have a question? <laughs> uh, yeah, here's one visualization about uh, the steps of a problem-based learning or our project. Uh, a bit adjusted. This uh, phenomenon was future of tourism, and we did it in cooperation with um, with the. Uh, no, I. I I'm not sure how to it call was, that in English, but it's a university that is uh, online as well, yeah. and and they teach tourism. Yeah. Yeah, tourism in in uh, but it's uh, 
it's this university, it's Korkeakoulu uh, High um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So we did it, it, did it in uh, cooperation, and at first we had this choosing our travel destination, which was the brainstorming part of this project. Then on the road, traveling, the exploring and uh, studying, finding out about the world. And then we got together to share our outcomes, which was sharing pics and memories from the trip. Our students didn't travel anywhere during this project, but it was um, an imaginary trip to the world. I think, I think that that kind of, if you can show the picture again, this kind of visualization, visualization uh, helps both the teachers and the, the students to get the picture, mm. what kind of a trip we're, we're talking about, and mm. they, it's easier for them to, to plan their schedules and how much mm. time they spend on, on <coughs> one of those phases. So I think this mm. using metaphors and using pictures and visualizations mm. helps a lot. Yeah. And the learning and uh, going through the project can be a bit chaotic, so we have at least some kind of structure where we can uh, then find our own on ways to learn and explore the work. Uh, our, nowadays our curricula are, they are quite fact-based. There's uh, all the subjects, they are listed what kind of facts and knowledges you need to uh, go through during the school. But we wanted to bring more uh, competencies and know-how. We wanted that in uh, phenomenon-based learning you can, at the same time that you learn the facts that you need to know, you can practice different kinds of uh, competencies. They can be uh, mm, mental competencies or, for example, handicraft, uh, concrete, uh, working with your hands. Here we have uh, OECD's uh, OECD has made this, they have uh, listed the competencies in three main categories, which are acting autonomously and use to, using tools interactively and interacting in heterogeneous groups. And they have sub subcategories as well, but these are the main, main categories. How to manage in the world, in future education and in future working life, professional life. But as I said, it can be handicrafts as well. Uh, our outcomes, they might be blogs, videos, music, uh, some kind of surveys and stat statistical work, uh, knitting, uh, making jewelry, actually. After our trip in Germany, one of our students uh, decided to make a uh, Jewelry, you can see the picture in, uh, on top. Uh, they, she made with her children jewelry about uh, those um, researchers, known researchers. There was, for example, a jewelry that represented uh, Charles Darwin. So it can be many things. Or it can be arts and audio files, essays, research papers. So we uh, demand our students, if they want to complete their courses in this problem-based uh, learning, they have to show some kind of outcome as well, uh, outcome as well at the end of the, the mm -hmm. project. Something that is somehow visible or audible, something that they can share to their peers and, and to, the, to the teachers. So these are examples of them. Mm -hmm just to add to your... clarification. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when our students started, or, and, or when we started in 2007 with this pro, uh, phenomenon-based learning, and we encouraged from the very beginning yeah. our students to, to show, make their, what they have learned, visible also in, in, in several ways. But during the first maybe two, three years, they were all writing these academic essays. essays. And research papers. And research yeah. papers, and that was it. Even if we encouraged them to, to, to take pictures and, and make a, 
uh, photo exhibition or make a theatre play or mm. it could be anything or arrange some event in their in their uh, own hometown or or make a, a citizens initiative to the uh, city council mm. it could be whatever but they were reading the writing these essays but now slowly they have started to do something else as, as well mm. but it takes time yeah when students are studying at the upper secondary school, then they think that it has to be all this yes, written yes, and yes. academic. Yeah. And usually that's all they've known that school is. They have the tradition. Of course, they need to learn out from that kind of mm. ways to think and to think that knowledge can all only be uh, shown in, in essays. But yeah, here are some examples in pictures. For example, the on the top left corner, we had this uh, phenomenon. It was from happiness, actually. And this student had a situation where she had, didn't have enough time to spend with her kids. And she started to think, what could she do that she could involve her kids into? And she started to do this uh, tree of happy life or good life and going through psychology and philosophy and on those pink or magneta, what is it, uh, the color, she started to write facts about how we, um, how we get to be happy and how could she define happiness and good life and what part belongs in there and so on. And she did it with her, her children. <clears throat> and then on the bottom left, uh, one student started to go through geo geometry from her own house and her own, uh, she had big um, farm, they had horses and stuff like this and she started to find out, find the geomet geometrical uh, for, uh, patterns uh, in her own surroundings, for example, the haystack, how, how do you measure the, the, um, how much hay do you have <laughs> in that one stack and so on and so on, how tall are the trees and, and stuff like this. So she started to study with something that's very close to herself and that's important in her, her life, her home and, and the farm. And that way, even, you, even when you have a subject that is, you don't like, like in this, in this case, the student didn't like maths at all. She hated it, and she never, she was never good in maths. And now that she've done them in, uh, what should I say, ten phenomena, and she've done many math courses like this, and she she has found herself the way to learn maths, and she has really, she will, she's always, can I do more maths in this and this and this phenomena? And that's great. You'll find the the. Uh, burning to some something when it comes to close to yourself. Then we did uh, cooperation with children as well in Ottawa, where our school uh, physically is located. Uh, this is also from Happiness, actually, and we did, did this uh, online web radio program where our, we have mul multicultural students in, in our campus, our physical campus, and these multicultural students went to the, the basic elementary, elementary school yeah, <laughs> that is located close to our, our own uh, school, and they went to two interviews. They practiced Finnish at the same time, and then they interviewed the children. At, what do you think is happiness for you? And they did the same for seniors as well, older, older citizens. So we had uh, happiness from very small children to the people who are uh, older, also already in, during their pension years. Another example with our uh, cooperation with smaller kids. Here you have the school that Taru mentioned earlier, the online uh, basic education for children, Finnish children that live abroad. And this was another uh, phenomenon, and it was 
languages and cultures, if I don't, if I remember it right, and they uh, explored the the school school rest school Mikael Ruokala school canteen yeah school canteen uh, cultures in different countries. Do they bring their own food or do they have free food and what kind of food food they eat and so on? It can be very concrete when we have uh, smaller children. And here are some examples about statistics as well. You can combine, for example, learning about well-being and, uh, and uh, well-being of yourself or well-being of the nature and then make, for example, surveys and learn about statistics at the same time. And uh, our students get the credits uh, like uh, in other uh, ways to learn. If they take non-stop courses, they'll get biology and mathematics and uh, psychology and so on, or in the collab collaborative courses. But when they come to uh, phenomenon-based learning projects, they get partial credits or complete credits. If, for example, this that you see, if she combined uh, psychology and statistics from maths and uh, Finnish language literature as well, when she started to think what is welfare and wellness for me and being happy, and she made a small survey and then she also, act yeah, she actually knitted, uh, uh, what is it? <laughs> wooden, wooden, woolen cap, yeah. Uh, as part of uh, being uh, a kind of a mindfulness exercises, what could you do to keep keep yourself calm and calm and happy? So we give the credits, uh, like in other ways. Um, it's not just a hobby for the for our students; they learn the same way as they do in in other courses. Uh, some feedback from our students. Uh, this is uh, uh, she says or he, I don't know. In my opinion, lack of clear instructions as well as too much freedom makes phenomenon-based learning challenging. And this is true because you have to do very much yourself and you need to uh, own your own learning processes. You need to think about how much time do I need what do I need to do? Where do I find the materials? Uh, do I know how to use these apps and uh, others, other, other things? It can be very challenging, especially if you're used to uh, this uh, so-called normal school where you just go to the classroom, you sit there, the teacher tells you what to do, when to do it, how to do it, what pages to open what uh, exercises to do. You don't have to do, decide anything when you just go there and memorize things and then you go to another course. But then other students said that you shouldn't be discouraged if in the beginning you feel that you can't really get anywhere. You might need to work hard to see things in broader contexts. As it is, learning always takes time and it's, it's, um, it's never easy. Memorizing can be easy, but deep learning is not. You always need to make an effort. And then phenomena are another different way of learning. That's why you need to work hard and not only read books. Learning is effective and you remember well the things you've learned. I think that's, that's the most important thing for our students to find the ways they learn best and that, that serves them the best because that's the main <laughs> main thing why we exist as a school and teachers to make our students learn more effectively uh, do you have some questions about our practical how we've organized our phenomenon based projects or about the students outcomes or <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah. So the question was, if I repeat it, yeah, uh, was 
about how we choose the phenomena, because we can't go to Germany to the museum every year. Yeah. <laughs> that was a good question. A really good question, <laughs> yeah. So that was one example. And then the current events. Current events is another. We check the calendar for the coming year and check if there's something that we need to take, um, take in consideration when we choose our uh, phenomena. But then we have these, um, how could I say, themes in our national curricula that we take in consideration as well. These themes are like safety and uh, sustainable development. Sustainable development, yeah. <laughs> I, you, I shouldn't be, uh, I know the words, but I, I keep uh, being insecure about using them, yeah. So the national curricula is one. Then we, uh, some of our um, phenomena are from the subjects as well. We might be like time and energy. It's, it's a physical concept, but then you can explore it from many kind of points, many points of views. Uh, then we've asked about our students and our teachers, what kind of phenomena would you like to uh, explore and study? That's one way that we've uh, collected the phenomena to be are there others I think mainly mm. how we choose them uh, we have been using uh, one way or also how to to build and construct mm. our uh, academic years so uh, we have what we call this cycle model. We don't have a picture of it here, but soon it will be there. <laughs> so in the autumn, like I said, that we don't even have uh, semesters or uh, periods because our school is always open, but we don't study the phenomena during the summer times, but we always start the phenomena in the autumn, and then we have five or six phenomena during the academic year. And in August, we always uh, start with a phenomenon that has something to do or is very close to the individuals. So Aki has written their self. So for example, la last autumn we started with a phenomenon that was called my own rights, was it? My individual rights. Mm -hmm. Or the previous year we started in August with the question, question, who am I? So it is a lot about identity. And uh, then the next cycle, when we go further into the autumn, so sometime in September or October, we go to the second uh, cycle, and there the phenomena that are located here have something to do with society. So we go a bit further away from ourselves to the next, to our surroundings. Mm. Can you give an example from there? I can't remember right now. Groups and society, we've done uh, cities, cities and landscapes, mm -hmm. that has been one. Because for it can example. be also uh, how the, for example, how the city is organized, what's the infrastructure and how people people are organized in there. It can be groups and society, both, both aspects mm -hmm. in that field. And then towards the winter, we go a bit further to the culture circle. There's always one phenomenon regarding with culture. And then further on to nature and environment. And then the last, the broadest circle is... is uh, I didn't know how meta. to... Uh, <laughs> how is it? How do we say in Finnish? Meta, yeah. Tietoisuus, Tiet con consciousness, actually, mm, mm. isn't it? Yes. Yeah. It's, so, it's so this is already quite abstract in the in yeah. the spring in in May, mm. uh, and we we have this model. It helps us. We pick always various uh, uh, phenomena and topics, but we place them on on this model. So it, it helps the planning a lot. Mm. And sometimes we use the same for only one. Uh, phenomenon-based learning, because usually the phenomena are things you can uh, explore in the concept of yourself. What's my, um, my, uh, how do I, uh, how, how is it in me? How is it in society, in groups? 
for example, happiness. How do you see it in culture, in nature, and environment? What is what are the the relations between the phenomenon and these dimensions? So you can use this one for two two meanings. Yes. And the, the German phenomena, they are just something that we stole from them. So <laughs> and we are using them several times. But actually okay. those as a mega trends, or yes. how do you say it, is actually uh, almost all of them are somehow written in our national curricula as well. But they, are, they have never uh, really been taken in the school, everyday school life, those. Okay, that was a good question. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. So, uh, excuse, sorry, should we use the microphone so that it could be interpreted? Just a second. Yes, thank you. Okay, yes, not a question, but perhaps two observations. I think there are two elements that make PBL really significantly important. And that is, first, learn by doing. Mm. We learn not abstractly, but concretely, by actually making an action and doing something. And a lot of times when I'm attending conferences, we all talk about how we're going to use the internet, we're going to use the web to find resources. But there's another really important learning element, and that is the student or the learner giving back, to leave an artifact for somebody else to discover and use as they begin to unfold their own learning journey. So remember that problem-based learning or phenomenon-based learning is about being active, really learning by doing. And by doing something, I leave something behind for someone else to discover. And I think those are really two really important elements for PBL. Mm. So thanks. Yeah. I that's totally a, agree. Thank yeah. you. That's a very good point. Uh, the outcomes of our students are online. We encourage them to make them so that they can share them online and leave them there for, for further use. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Will you take the microphone as well? Um, I would uh, ask you, have you uh, in Finnish school a uh, problem with students uh, that uh, students uh, spend a lot of time in internet with uh, computers, with uh, devices, and others and uh, communication uh, communication skill skills of students in real life are very very low uh, they have um, habits uh, to communicate uh, with other students other peoples through devices mm -hmm. have you the same problems in finnish school and the other questions about your curriculum have you um, a special subject uh, to uh, develop communication skills of students in your curriculum? Mm -hmm. About the, the curriculum, uh, we don't have a special subject called communication, but mm -hmm. it's built in, especially the, the coming new uh, the national curriculum. curriculum, it is very much the skills are built in it, written in it, but not as subjects. Maybe the languages, but not, not otherwise, really. But when Aki showed this picture of, uh, of the, the competencies, there's this, you, this pink colored using tools interactively. Those skills uh, or that category include the ICT skills, the communication skills, uh, and uh, also langu language skills. And then there's this interacting in heterogeneous groups. It's, it's about cooperation, which is based on communication and interaction. But then there's also this uh, autonomous, uh, acting autonomously. So we think that uh, the way we have organized this phenomenon-based learning supports learning of these skills very well, actually, even if we don't underline them, we don't tell our students that now you're learning these skills. Mm. So I think 
or do you, did you want to mm. add something? I think they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. uh, communication in, in virtual realities and through internet and devices, and then communication in, in real life. We don't have smaller children in our school, mm -hmm. but we've uh, came, come up to, with many uh, teachers and we've talked about this in Finland. Is it a problem that students use their devices so much? But they actually use them quite naturally. They might be checking out something and at the same time they discuss in small groups or they might stop to do something with their own device and then they can get back to the... It's, I think it's for our generation, it's uh, different, the use of um, devices. I don't see it as a threat, but I see that the school has to uh, teach and uh, we have to go through the, the use of devices. Why do we have them? How do we, uh, um, how do we uh, communicate with other, other people? Can we use devices here and can we use it there? And uh, what to do with them? It's part of learning for life and in life the devices and the internet is there. We just have to learn together how to use it and how to, how to, how to be with people and how to be with devices both, both ways, I think. And when we're talking about our school, only about our school, then uh, using the internet and the, the, the devices and the, those channels, that's the only possible way of our students mm. to, to get to study. Otherwise, they, would, they wouldn't be able to study. So, there it's very simple, but when talking about schools in general in Finland, then it's like okay, mm. was man telling us. Yeah, and many of our students actually uh, have found it very empowering to, they have found their voice, so to speak, mm. in our school. They might have been, been bullied in, uh, in their own school. They might have had some social problems or uh, anx anxiety disorder or something like this, and then they get the courage. They come to our school and they find out that, that okay, I, I can do things, I can communicate with people, and I'm, I'm good at this. And many times they find the courage to do it in real life as well, when they get the pos positive uh, feedback from other people first online, and then they get... But it's not always like that. Of course, we have also problems with... Uh, and it depends if you ask some other... Finnish teachers, they would answer you totally differently, probably. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But ICT skills are in, in one role in our new curricula, national curricula, so it's, it's a deba debate in Finland at, at the moment as well. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I have just a little question. Uh, which kind of school is it? Is it an high school? Is it a liceum? Is it a professional school? Is it a technical school? Uh, at the end of the school, the student, which kind of diploma they get? Yeah, it's a high school, so it's upper secondary school. Is it okay? It's a secondary school, yeah. but uh, uh, in um, which uh, topic, uh, for which topic this school is specific? They study ancient language, they study how to make jewelry, they study how to build a house, what they study exactly in this school? Mm. Our school, it is not vocational, you were talking now about okay. vocation, it's not, it's no. general education. Not general education. Yes. Yeah, like uh, gymnasium. Yes, uh, when you do uh, phenomenon-based learning, uh, uh, how many students uh, do you have in each course and how <laughs> many uh, teachers? <laughs> that was a good question because we don't have that many students in choosing this way of studying. Mm -hmm. The majority are doing the non-stop courses and, and the uh, collaborative courses and the minority are coming to this phenomenon based learning because it's still a bit something strange, maybe a bit scary as well. Mm. But the majority of those students who have tried this, joined one project to study some one phenomena, most of them come again and again and again and again. They are totally hooked. 
Yes, yeah, so we have uh, some sort of uh, similar experience uh, with uh, um, teaching uh, languages uh, with a video conference system. Mm -hmm. So nobody wanted to do this. Uh, then uh, when they tried once, uh, they always uh, yeah. came back. But uh, another thing, but uh, to be uh, good uh, for you, how many um, students uh, can uh, support uh, this system. You can do this with uh, 30, 40, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, in a class uh, to do a phenomenon based learning. There is a minimum or a maximum, no, a minimum, no, but a maximum of students uh, you can have uh, f for each teacher if uh, we have to organize it, for example. Uh, it, it depends on the students. When the students learn to work like this, they become more self-organized and uh, they know how to do it. They learn the tricks, how to get through it, and then they need less one the teacher to help them uh, individually. And if you use in classroom, uh, flipped classroom, is, is it, do you know the term? Yeah. And you can do it, uh, for example, by that. So then the students help each other and you, uh, your role is not to guide everyone individually and, and give lectures and prepare everything, but the students have the, uh, the guidance for the, the steering wheel, so to speak, for their own, own learning. But, it's, uh, mm -hmm. but when, when the students come first time, they need very much guidance to, to learn how to manage like this in these kind of projects. So you mean that with the, this system you can have also a lot of students studying together because they help each other, because uh, they can cooperate. So <coughs> you can have also a bigger class uh, on the subject. We so. would like to have more students there that, than what we have at the moment. Mm. So we really don't have experience of having 200 students studying one phenomenon. So it's just a handful of students, maybe 20, uh, 25 20 students, uh, 40. Mm. what we have had La so Last far. question, I'm sorry. Mm. Uh, do you have a, um, which is the technical system? Do you have a video conference? Uh, mm. Okay, so yeah. you meet in a video conference with a share uh, a dashboard and uh, so on. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. Yes. We, we have... Uh, Adobe yeah, just kind of Connection Pro. We yes. use that one. And then but we have this... Um, but we have uh, our own uh, learning platform where the other courses take place, the non-stop courses and the collaborative courses. But this phenomenon based learning oh. we have taken out to an open and public platform because we wanted to get out of the school, get out of the... Um, open the doors from the school and, and also to, to involve other experts and other people. For example, now the, the project, uh, the, the phenomenon that we are studying, it's called consciousness, actually, is it? Is it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there I just saw the discussions. There was somebody, it was an, a teacher from some other school, and she said, she was introducing herself there, and she said that this is me and I'm teaching at that school and I'm not going to study anything here. I mean, complete, com complete any courses or anything, but I found this so interesting that I would like to join the discussions if it's okay. So this open and public uh, platform makes it possible for the others to join the discussions as well. And it's very good for our students to learn how to uh, behave in that kind of public environment where everything you say and write down, it's, anybody can see it. So it's also a learning process in itself. So what the students write there, it's on that platform, but then we use Adobe Connect for virtual conferences so that we can meet real time with our audio and, and web cameras and so. And then we use a lot of shared documents so that the students can process one document together and so on so forth. So several tools are integrated, but yeah. I forgot that I'm not in Finland. I tried to get the mobile connection, <laughs> but I don't have the mobile network here. I could have shown you the our, uh, environment. Okay, but we have 10 minutes time. Should yes. we start the... With 
George, to give you a one uh, closing, one way to make a closing reflection when you work, it's the traffic lights. Uh, there's the red, red one to stop, the yellow one to maybe keep on going, and then the green one to start something new. And we'd like you to, in small groups, uh, on the table, maybe three to five people, to think about what needs to be stopped to get to the point where you can make phenomenon-based learning projects in your school, to make cooperation with other uh, people outside your school or in, in, with your colleagues. What needs to be what needs to keep going on and develop, be developed further, and what totally new do you have, need to have in your uh, school culture? Or it can be concrete or abstract. It doesn't have to be uh, devices or stuff like this. this but it can be also um, something about thinking and your attitude towards your own work and towards your students or organizational structures or whatever. What needs to be? Get, uh, what? Uh, what? What do you need to get rid of? What do you need to keep on and develop further? And what do you need to add to your current way of the teaching and organizing? If you wanted to, yeah, it's all. If you okay. wanted to to change your way of teaching and, and start this phenomenon based Based learning. learning. Maybe you don't need to get rid of anything. Maybe you're ready for that. We don't know. But if, <laughs> think of it, if there's something that you should get rid of, some, some attitudes or structures, whatever. Ways of and, thinking. And I'm or... sure that there's already a lot of good that you want to, to keep and maybe develop a bit further. Maybe you would need to, to think about something totally new as well. Mm. So this is your last exercise before, before you are going to have a break. <laughs> Just discuss, and if you want to take notes, there are papers at least at some, some tables, if you want to. But talk to each other. Okay, it is a pity to interrupt because I see that you are talking a lot and discussing. I hope you can, you will have the time slots to continue the discussion during the day. At least there will be a coffee break after this session. But uh, we won't go through all the groups because we don't have the time for that. But is there somebody in some, some of these groups that would like to mention something that you talked about. What was the most burning topic that you were talking about? Is there something that you would like to share with, with others? The biggest thing is attitude. The most important thing is the attitude change in uh, teachers, uh, school, and parents. Mm -hmm. And if we can change that, then we can move on. That's that. I think it, that is the m only problem. Everything else uh, is easier to change. Mm. To find I, a new mindset. Yes, so I, I agree, because it's very easy to blame the structures, for example, to say that it's impossible because we have these structures. But if you have the right attitude, then you can do a lot within the frameworks that you are given. So I, I totally agree with you. Is there something else? There we go. Uh, one of the things that we're talking about is when you do PBL, don't disappear. Be a part of the process yourself. Guide your students. Direct them to certain possibilities. Open the doors for them. Let mm. them explore. But don't leave the room. <laughs> they need you. Good point. That was a good point, indeed. That's something we need to keep, the teacher, yes. still, <laughs> even <laughs> yeah, though we don't teach. Yeah, the teachers are still <laughs> needed, definitely. Yeah. But maybe we could think about what the role of the teacher yeah. is in the room. Mm -hmm. There's another. Oh, sorry. I 
would like to comment actually, you know, I, I've been doing problem based, not phenomenal based learning, problem based learning for the last 25 years, you know, and the result is incredible. You can ask my student, you know, that, you know, that what they told me is that this is the best module that I have ever done in my life. This is the only module that I have learned anything from the university. And this is the one that I carry with me, you know, to my career. And most of my ex student now are vice president of Deutsche Bank, vice president, you know, and so on. You know why they told me? All my results coming from problem-based learning that I have learned from you, nothing else. I learned nothing from the university, but I, I have learned how to solve problems. I have learned how to think critically. I have learned how to learn, and I have learned how to communicate. So it's wonderful. If you see it, you know, you ask any of my ex-students, they tell you that this is the best thing that happened to me, nothing else. But you might think that, how do I start that? I started nearly 25 years ago. I learned about PBL. My boss told me, I went back to my, my boss, I said, I want to implement PBL in my, my, my class. He said, no, no way, what is PBL? I never heard of it. He said, I said, but it's good. I, I've been to the, to the workshop for two weeks, you know, I want to do it. He said, no chance. So I, I said, just give me one semester, all right? He said, okay, you do it one semester. If it fell, no more. You know, it was so good that, <laughs> you know, I will continue doing that ever since. So don't let your, your management tell you you can't do it, you know. If you have the determination, you get there. And the result is incredible. Really, beyond what you can imagine. It's really the best, you know, way of teaching students. Thank you. Thank you. Do you think this would be the, the good closing words? Or did you have something? You, did you want to mention something? No? Okay, so because our time, I think, is is out, so we just say you thank you very much for your active participation. It was very nice to, to have this opportunity to spend this morning with you, and I wish you a very nice conference still today. We will be here just to grab some coffee, and then we have to go, but we will be for like for half an hour or so here on the campus, so if you want to, to... If you have any questions or yeah. you want to discuss about something still. And then we'll be in Finland, but we, it's not far away and you have our <laughs> contacts there. <laughs> we won't disappear. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.